25th of March 1918, after another night of heavy shelling, Second Lieutenant Walter Toll is preparing to lead his men from a regiment known as the Football Battalion on a perilous mission to assault the German front line. The situation was desperate. The Germans had the upper hand and they could sense victory was in sight. Their plan was to deal a death blow to the British by employing a new tactical force into the field of combat. German stormtroopers were the first example of shock troops, special forces deployed to create deadly chaos and mayhem. This is the story of Walter Tull, football hero, military legend, and the first black officer to lead white men into battle in the British Army. He would be in the thick of one of the bloodiest conflicts of the war, one which would decimate his battalion and where only a handful of men would survive. He is the striker of the song. I'm Bruce Crompton, history fanatic, military antique collector and ex-paratrooper. In Amazing War Stories, you're going to hear about incredible actions, all taken from records housed in museum collections. It's only by unearthing these wonderful tales that I hope to keep these important institutions and the heroes contained within them alive for future generations. The long convoy of three-ton Dennis trucks snaked along the muddy roads of France in the region known as the Somme. They were heading towards the front line, which was currently around the vicinity of a now bombed out town called Bathum. They had already done a long march today in the wet, gloomy weather. And now this final leg of their journey was by lorry. But in 1918, they had solid rubber tires, which were not too comfortable either. On board were members of the 23rd Battalion of the Middlesex Regiment. With such an uncomfortable ride, they couldn't wait for the journey to end. Their destination, an open field, next to the French monument at the crossroads of the arras Bapun Road, 25 miles away. When they finally arrive, they are told to disembark. The officers on the ground take in charge, but one is strikingly different. He's black and his name is Walter Toll. He's a platoon leader in a unit also known as the Football Battalion. Using their ground sheets and with no blankets, they would have spent a miserable few hours in foggy and wet conditions trying to get some rest. Walter would have shared his discomfort with his men and would have done his best to encourage them, perhaps pointing out that the monument was to a French victory and was a good omen. The inscription on it read, to the memory of the French soldiers who gloriously fell in defence of the nation at the Battle of Bapu. However, the memorial's apocalyptic inscription must have unnerved his men. But not Toll, he had seen much worse after three years of fighting. In fact, he'd even fought here before during the first Battle of the Somme. One of my most treasured collections are my First World War medals. Some of them tell unique stories of valour. It's one of the reasons I got into military collecting. Anyway, as I was organising the display to show some visiting school children, I came across a very unusual set of coins. They had been produced by the Royal Mint to celebrate the centenary of the Great War, and I totally forgot about them. One of them particularly caught my eye. It was a huge five pound coin and on its back had a picture of Walter Tull. I literally knew nothing about this man, but he must have had an incredible story if he was to have a coin minted in his honour. What I was to discover about this man totally blew me away. 
Andy Robertshaw is a former curator of the Royal Logistic Corps Museum and also a historian and military advisor on many documentaries and feature films, including the Oscar and BAFTA winning film 1917. I asked him to tell us what he knew about this stage of the war in the Somme, where Tull and his men now found themselves. The deadly First World War had been raging for four years, and by March 1918, the German High Command believed the Allied forces were exhausted by the fighting. So in March, they planned to launch their Spring Offensive, or Kaiser's Battle. The Americans had only recently entered the war, and the enemy sensed that it could be their last chance of victory. They knew if they attacked now, they could defeat the Allies before the United States could fully deploy its resources. This major offensive was intended to break through the Allied forces along the Western Front in Northern France, to seize the ports of the Channel that provided supplies to the British Expeditionary Force and then drive them into the sea. There were four planned offensives and Tull found himself right in the middle of the first and as it would turn out, the largest and most dangerous one. On the 21st of March, Operation Michael, the first spring offensive, was launched. Four German armies stretching for more than 40 miles attacked the British front line. In command was General Erich Ludendorff, a politician and military theorist his famed German victories at the beginning of the war meant he dominated every tactical decision during the conflict. He was a formidable foe. At the Somme, he planned to go in with an overwhelming force. He had assembled 74 divisions, 6,600 guns, 3,500 mortars, and 326 fighter aircraft in readiness for the assault. Although the British were prepared for the onslaught, the sheer scale of the attack could overwhelm them. And it was the job of officers like Toll who had to encourage their men to fight. What they didn't know was the German general wasn't just relying on a force of numbers. He also had a new super weapon, the Stormtrooper. These were an elite troop, the special forces of their day, kitted out with the latest weaponry and trained in ferocious hand-to-hand -hand fighting. These soldiers were the pride of the German army. Whilst Tull and his men ate their rations and drank tea around the memorial, they literally had no idea that in less than a day, they would be facing these fearsome troops head on. As the men recuperated under the war memorial after their long journey, Tull received an order to move out. They were leaving in just a few hours at midnight to move up towards the front line at the village of Burnie, seven miles away. A two-hour march lay ahead under the cover of darkness, followed by digging of trenches for shelter. By now, Walter and his men could hear the sounds of battle not far off to the east. Ominously, the men were handed out grenades and ammunition. Walter knew what this meant. They were going into action. I imagine Tull, 29, and now an experienced officer, encouraged his men with great footballing stories from his past. It was, after all, why most men in the football battalion had signed up to be close to their footballing heroes, and Walter Tull was one of them. Walter was a remarkable individual. At the age of 26, he joined the 17th Battalion of the Middlesex Regiment, also known as the 1st Football Battalion, because Walter was in fact a professional footballer. Toll never took the easy road in life, and being black in a time when racism and prejudice abounded only seemed to spur him on. The son of a Caribbean immigrant, Walter had a harsh upbringing, and he and his brother Edward ended up in an orphanage in Bethnal Green, London. Sadly, 
Edward was later adopted by a family in Scotland and the two brothers were separated. But Walter found solace in playing football. Tull played for Clapton and Spurs before signing for Northampton Town. But now an even bigger challenge was looming, a world war. In 1914, there was no conscription. So army recruitment sergeants turned up at football matches with a gallant call for duty. If you go to our Amazing War Stories Instagram page, you can see the recruiting poster. Whilst the majority of the men in the battalion were football supporters, there were in fact 122 professional players who had also volunteered. These men from different clubs often formed close relationships. Tull CO was Alan Roderick Haig Brown, who had also played football for Clapton. Two fellow Northampton players, George Whitworth and Frank Taylor, signed up for Action 2, as well as Walter's close friend, Thomas Billingham, who played in goal for Northampton Town's reserves. Their actions on the battlefield and the events of Walter's Hole's War that would follow are astonishing. The technology of 1918 was unimaginable at the outbreak of the war. Just, just think about it. Yes, you've got shell fire, you've got shrapnel, you've got high explosive. But now what you've also got is the delivery of gas by shells. You've got aircraft overhead that can do ground attack and drop bombs as well as fight each other. Out at sea, you've, you've got submarines. War is now incredibly complicated. And very, very importantly, in the spring of 1918, the war goes away from static trench warfare that we recognise. Instead, it's a war of movement, mobility, as the Germans advance and we withdraw. So we've got soldiers now in basically the green fields of France, digging rapid shell scrapes and then fighting from them. This is now a war of mobility, a war of movement. No longer is it static. Walter and his men had already faced the worst Germany could offer. And despite suffering from shell shock and contracting trench fever, his tough background spurred him on in his fight to be recognised and respected. His fearless attitude and unbroken spirit was something he had learned on the football field, when racial abuse from opposition supporters was as challenging back then as it ever was. Even the British Army's view on race at the time was surprising. Military regulations then prevented, and I quote, any Negro or person of colour becoming an officer. Walter's father, Daniel, arrived in England from Barbados, a descendant of black slaves. Yet Walter impressed his superiors on the battlefield so much, he became the first black officer ever to lead white British troops into battle. His promotion to second lieutenant was an incredible achievement. Reading the unit's war diaries, I discovered that just the previous day before this story begins was the beginning of the deadly Kaiser's battle, as the offensive became known. By the end of the first day, the British had lost 7,512 dead and 10,000 wounded and now Walter and his men have joined the fight. The legend you're about to hear is taken entirely from eyewitness testimony and documents that were written shortly after the events. Everything is true, no matter how extraordinary it sounds. As dawn breaks, Walter and his men finally got some sleep after digging foxholes through the night. But the German army were also awake, preparing for action. The deadly stormtroopers were readying their kit for the assault. And just a few hours later, their ferocious attack would come. On the morning of the 23rd of March at 10.30am, Tull and his men were targeted when German artillery shells began to rain down amongst them. 
Cole knew they were exposed in the open ground. He had witnessed artillery barrages like this before and instructs his men to get flat and take cover in the trenches or craters to avoid the lethal trap. He knew as the barrages tended to creep forward, the chances of a second shell landing in exactly the same place were minimal. You just had to survive the first few explosions. But as his men desperately dodged the shells, Tull was already thinking about what was coming next. A barrage such as this usually meant one thing, an attack by ground troops. Then out of the smoke and gloom came a terrifying sight. Enemy soldiers carrying submachine guns and wearing lightweight boots came sprinting towards them. The stormtroopers had arrived. Andy explained to me why they were so effective. A feature of the Kaiserschlacht, the Kaiser's Battle of March 1918, is the mass use of stormtroopers. Stormtroopers have been around for a while in the German army, but now what we've got is a clique of young soldiers who are fit, well-fed, well-equipped, well-armed. And in March 1918, the weather plays along. Thick fog means that we don't see the enemy coming. And those German soldiers are now armed with flamethrowers, machine guns, submachine guns. And what they do is they look out for the weak points in the defences. They find a strong point, they go round it, they cut it off, they isolate it, leaving for follow-up troops to destroy it. And unfortunately, the British system of defence really is a series of blobs. And those blobs are now cut off and the enemy infiltrate behind them and the attack will keep on coming day after day after day even though the weather does get better they are very very effective and all those gains of the Somme and the battles afterwards are lost in hours as the enemy break into the allied defenses the stormtrooper of 1918 is well equipped well armed fit a deadly fighting force. The men facing this onslaught were ex-footballers and fans who had volunteered to fight to be near their heroes. And were mostly armed with short magazine Lee Enfield rifles, developed over 10 years earlier. Some of his men would have only just joined and would have never even fired a shot in anger, let alone witness a dead body. That was all about to change. Through the fog came the charging stormtroopers, firing machine guns. Tull steadied his men as the German smoke grenades landed in their trenches. Then the real fight began as the stormtroopers closed in on them. They were outnumbered and outgunned. Tull gave the order to withdraw and they put down rapid fire while each section retreated in turn. The Lewis guns from nearby D Company also joined the fight. Shaking, I imagine from physical and nervous exhaustion, the men of the football battalion withdrew to a new defensive position, a mile west of the trenches they dug the night before. The engagement came at a cost for Walter's regiment. Three killed, 36 wounded, 12 missing in action. No doubt, prisoners in German hands. Thankfully, Tull's quick actions meant the fighting retreat worked. The stormtrooper's shock tactic was diffused. They had picked the wrong battalion to have a scrap with. Tull knew this was a taste of things to come. But for now, he had successfully got most of his men out against incredible odds. They were exhausted, but alive. They were relieved and sent to rest that night at the airdrome of Favre U. But little did Tull know that the hell wasn't over. In fact, it was just beginning. And as he and his men recovered from the day's fighting, the stormtroopers were rearming. They had unfinished business and they would be back with another assault the next day. 
relative calm of the airdrome that evening in their bivouacs, the new recruits were still getting over the shock of that day's attack. Walter and close friend Thomas Biddingham wanted to bolster the spirits of their men. For the new recruits, the attack would have been terrifying. I'm sure Toll would have done his best to calm them down by regaling them with some of his war stories. After all, he'd been through a lot worse and had survived. He and Billingham were old hands, and I can picture them telling the freshers how Toll got his first commendation. The letter from Major General Sidney Lawford, read here by Walter's great-nephew, reads... I wish to place on record my appreciation of your gallantry and coolness. You were the first to cross the River Pavey on the raid of the 1st of January 1918. And during the raid, you took the covering party of the main body across and brought them back without a single casualty, in spite of heavy fire. If you look at the show notes, there's a link that will take you to see the letter kindly loaned to us by his family. I've no doubt stories like this would have helped to reassure Walter's men. As a professional footballer in a football battalion, he would also have captained his team, talking to his men, doing his best to cheer them up, showing that he was confident in their ability to stop the next attack. Andy reflects on how football was often used as a morale booster at times like these. The generation that went into the Great War had grown up in the United Kingdom with football. It was the, the big mass sport that people either played or they went to see their team. You've only got to think about the, the, the football match of Christmas Day 1914 during the Christmas truce. British soldiers against the Bavarians on that very rare occasion when there was no fighting. And then think about what happens when the men actually are resting. They come out of the trenches, they're filthy, they're exhausted. But time after time, officers say within a few hours, they're happily playing football again. And some officers use that to great effect. Captain Billy Neville uses it to encourage his soldiers forward on the 1st of July, 1916, on the first day of the Somme. They're allowed to kick ahead of them four footballs so that the men are kept busy with their eye on the ball and the idea is they're going to keep kicking these footballs forward until they get to the enemy position and apparently Captain Neville had told them the first man to score a goal getting that football in the enemy trench would get a reward. Sadly there was no reward because Captain Neville was dead within a few minutes but his men did take their position so did the footballs help? We'll never know it didn't do any harm. But the next day, there would be no truce or football match. At 11.30 on the 24th of March, Walter gathered his battle-weary men together and joined the rest of his battalion at the reserve trenches near Favreau. A reserve trench was dug behind the first and second lines of defence and the troops would consider it a place of comparative safety compared to the front line. There would be cooks whipping up meals, medical officers treating the wounded. But this time, I wonder whether Walter and his men would have felt that safe. As the day wore on, men from the front line began throwing themselves back into the reserve line from the bullet-ridden no man's land. Man after man hit the chalk floor of Walter's Trench. Tull and his men stood ready to hold their position. They wouldn't have to wait long. Suddenly, the reserve line was no more. Instead, it was now the front line, and they were all that stood between the German Imperial Army and a very different end to the war. 
British troops, all exhausted by lack of food and sleep, tried to fight back, but the onslaught was too much. At 9pm, they heard a familiar sound. Withdraw! Withdraw! Walter and his men scrambled west into the darkness to form a new defensive line. Back at the monument they had safely stayed at two nights earlier. In just two days, the situation had become critical for the football battalion. It was greatly under strength with the loss of nearly 80 men in 24 hours. Even worse, their new position offered no natural cover and there was little chance of support against a determined enemy attack. Things were looking bleak. Shoulder to shoulder with the Royal Engineers, the men of the 23rd Middlesex dug for their lives under the watchful presence of the monument. As it commemorates the French victory over the invading German army, I'm sure Walter would have hoped that it was a good omen that night. At 8am on the 25th of March 1918, just after the sun rose behind the heads of the German stormtroopers, Walter awoke to the sudden crump of German shells. Now serving under him, he also had the men he saw land face first into his trench during yesterday's retreat. He needed all the manpower he could get, but the numbers were still pitifully small compared with the seemingly never-ending supply of German shock troops. The bombardment continued to rain down, so Walter executed a withdrawal under covering fire. The Allied defenders rose from their trenches, ducking behind the monument of the French victory. Crossing the road in broad daylight and weaving between their own recently erected wire defences, using only shell holes as cover. But then there was another German shock attack. And once again, the stormtroopers reached the British trenches, quickly and in considerable numbers. The entry in the war diary of the 23rd Battalion Middlesex Regiment reads on that day Shelling of our lines commenced. Enemy continued to push forward in massed formation. It was not until the units both left and right had retired that the battalion commenced an orderly withdrawal. Casualties were heavy. 13 killed, 61 wounded, 30 missing. The German onslaught in the West had been long expected. Everybody knew it was coming. The question would be where and when. But when it happened, it was far more effective than anybody could have imagined. The new artillery tactics, the use of stormtroopers, the weather, the fog meant that the enemy couldn't be seen, which meant they could get amongst the British positions. The result was that the men found themselves retreating, in some cases, tens of miles back across the old battlefield of the Somme. And that battlefield had been abandoned for over a year. The men were simply digging in wherever they could, possibly even using old trenches. And as they advanced, the Germans found untold riches. They found stores with champagne, extra ammunition. They found themselves with chocolate and cigarettes, blankets they hadn't seen for years. In some ways, this is terrible for the Allies. In other ways, it's actually quite bad for the Germans because they realise that their opponents are not starving, they are not threadbare, and some Germans simply get drunk. The key idea of the Kaiser's Battle, the Kaiserschlacht of March 1918, is to split the French army in the south from the British army in the north. The key objective are the channel ports, because if the stormtroopers, the German army can get there, the British army will simply have to withdraw. Everybody knows about Dunkirk in 1940. Well, it almost could have happened in 1918 had the enemy been more successful. But at this point, Walter Tull and his men, everybody would realize the seriousness of the situation. General Haig gives an order, backs to the wall, and that's what they're facing. There can be 
no general retreat, because if that happens, the war is over. Things had turned desperate. Tull and his depleted force bravely faced the hordes of Germans. The former Tottenham striker responded the only way he knew. When he played football, he knew the best defence was offence. Let the players come to you and then swiftly attack. And that's exactly what he did. Standing side by side with his best friend Billingham, Tull surged forward and faced the charging Germans. If he could just hold them off, it would give his men a chance to organise a defence or a fighting retreat. The ferocious German attack was overwhelming, despite British covering fire from the air. Battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Alan Haig Brown, was driven out of his dugout and lost his life machine gun down as he tried to coordinate a rear guard action along the main road that runs past the memorial. And right in front of that monument to victory, in no man's land, Walter must have felt the Kaiser's breath on the back of his neck as he faced the mass of advancing German stormtroopers. Captaining his team, he coordinated the rapid fire of their Lee Enfield and Lewis guns which once again gave his men enough time to fall back to defendable positions. But this time, the Germans were ready for this tactic. Thomas Billingham was only 30 yards away from his close friend and commanding officer as the machine guns sprayed bullets at the retreating British forces. Under withering German fire, Billingham saw his friend crumple and fall among the Allied defensive barbed wire. Walter had been hit. Despite the danger, the goalkeeper rushed to the striker's aid. But it was no use. Tull had been fatally shot through the head. Thomas couldn't leave his friend in no man's land. Several of Tull's men made valiant efforts to help Billingham drag his body back to the British position to secure him a decent burial. But it was too much. The volume of gunfire from the advancing Germans made it impossible. Billingham would never see his friend again. In the 13-day period between the 19th and 31st of March, the 23rd Battalion Middlesex Regiment lost 396 men with the worst day for casualties being the 25th of March, the day that Tull was killed in action, when 91 men sacrificed their lives. If it hadn't been for Tull and the men of the football battalion, the war could have ended very differently. Their staunch but ultimately failed attempt at least managed to slow the German offence. And very importantly, the remains of the battalion were relieved that night. Fresh soldiers came in and this time, as the Germans advanced, it was slower. Ultimately, it would be halted, then turned round and in August 1918, driven back. Walter's family still have personal letters sent by senior officers after Walter's death. Duncan Finlayson is Walter's great nephew. In a letter of condolence by Major Poole of the 23rd Middlesex to Walter's brother Edward, my grandfather, he broke army rules and stated that Walter was recommended for a military cross. No further record of this was ever unearthed by the family or the army, and the medal was never awarded. Another letter of condolence was also sent by Lieutenant Pickard to my grandfather, in which he wrote how popular Walter was throughout the battalion. He was brave and conscientious. He had been recommended for the military cross and had certainly earned it. The commanding officer had every confidence in him and he was liked by the men. Now he has paid the supreme sacrifice. The battalion and company have lost a faithful officer. Personally, I have lost a friend. Can I say more? Except that I hope that those who remain 
may be true and faithful as he. Walter served and survived for almost the entire duration of the war and was posthumously awarded the 1914-15 star, the British War and Victory Medal for his service, which was sadly stolen during a burglary at the home of one of Walter's relatives near Dundee. However, they still have his 1909 Tottenham Hotspur Charity Winners Medal and many other photos, artefacts and memorabilia of Walter's tragically short life. Thankfully, Toll's former teammates George Whitworth and Frank Taylor, along with his close friend Thomas Billingham, all made it through the war. Hayde Brown was buried at Ashet Le Grand Cemetery. Walter has inscriptions on memorials in northern France where he fought and at home. And there's a statue in his honour in Northampton, the town he last played football for. But Toll's story doesn't end there. Thanks to the painstaking work of our amazing research team and with the help of historian Andy Robertshaw, we not only now know where Walter Toll died, but also that his body may well have been recovered and where he may have finally been laid to rest. So we put Andy in touch with Walter Toll's family and this is the moment he told them what he found. From what we've got, it's possible to follow his final journey, I mean, literally almost minute by minute, uh, as they make their way back past the, the French War Memorial and then to the field where I am pretty certain he was killed in an action leapfrogging their platoons backwards to ensure the others can get away. However, the War Graves Commission recovered from that area a total of 13 soldiers. Now this is the key point, matches almost exactly the 13 missing killed. However, it ignores our two missing officers, total 15. And what we've got here is that close to where the Colonel was found, an officer was recovered in the 20s, no regiment, no rank. He's buried in Asiat the Grand, within two graves of the colonel. But the key point about my cluster of bodies around the sunken crossroads is that actually we've got some soldiers by name from the battalion, but it then tells me that we've got six soldiers. If it says soldier where they recovered remains and they were not certain whether it was a private or corporal or indeed an officer that had fallen with his men, and I think it's a mass grave dug by the Germans, they buried them, and then they recovered after the war. Which means he is now buried um, as an unknown soldier of the regiments in Crossell's Military Cemetery. Oh, all right, thank you. If you went to Crossell's and were to lay a wreath or a poppy on one of those unknown, you are pretty close, or as close as I can get you, to where he ultimately ended up. But it does seem to suggest that he's not under a farmer's field somewhere in France. He actually has a, a, a grave, although not marked with his name. It's, it's a lovely idea to think that he, he actually has a resting place. Funnily enough, when I did visit uh, Arras, the War Graves Commission cemetery there, and, and saw his name of yep. 35,000 others, it did seem particularly poignant. And it, it, even there, I kind of felt closest to Walter. So actually, a headstone seems to kind of bring you even closer to yes. the story and to him. Yes, well, thank you very much for all this. No, I'm, I'm immensely grateful, Andy. Walter Toll's memory and inspiration will live on as a pioneer and a role model who triumphed over adversity and refused to give up. So now I know why the Royal Mint made a five pound commemorative coin in his honour, to serve as a permanent reminder of this remarkable individual. More details, maps and pictures of Walter and his letters, kindly loaned to us by his family, are on our show notes, along with links for you to learn more about this amazing war hero and football legend. There are also a few memorial sites you can visit if you wish to reflect on his service and sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs>
If you want to learn more about the Great War, there are many museums you can visit. The Kent Museum of Moving Image in Deal, where they have some fantastic footage and stills. War Years Remembered in Ballyclare, Northern Ireland, has a collection spanning hundreds of years of military history, including a World War I horse display and even the signal that ended the war on the 11th of November 1918. In France, there is the Museum of the Great War, housed within the Chateau de Peron in the heart of the World War I Somme battlefields. I really want to help museums, both big and small, in these difficult times. They've taken a financial battering, and I'm worried that if we're not careful, the important stories they hold will become locked away from the public forever. Please take the time to give this podcast a like or a review, as it helps it to be found by other listeners. Or even subscribe. It's free. One final thing. A word of thanks to the people, museums and organisations who free of charge gave up their time to help me tell this story. This episode of Amazing War Stories was researched by Ross Barnwell and written and produced by Paul Wooding. The executive producer is Ed Sayer and the associate producer is Lois Crompton. Sound design and 3D mastering is by Vaudeville Sound and music is by Extreme Music. Thank you.